like so. There we go. All righty. Let's do a little bit of music for y'all. enough of that. Oh, let me go to half share. Oh, that's horrible. Is that any better? Oh, that's a little bit better. Well, hello there, good people. How y'all doing? Let me switch over here to this screen here. How y'all doing? I'm Jason with Green Country Agroforestry. It's Wednesday afternoon, about 7.30 in the evening, and I just realized it's getting on into fall, and uh, we're not going to have a whole lot of light later on in the evening on the porch for too much longer i went ahead and rigged a little little spare light up there to the side so that you might be able to see me tonight but i can tell it's start, already starting to get a little bit dark out there and we'll probably go to a, a faded black and white sort of screen before too awful long so these uh wednesday live streams i might have to start scheduling for a little bit earlier in the day or maybe move them to a different day. I don't know which yet. Let me get this coffee cup out of the way for a minute because I want to show you what we're working with today. Oh, hi, everybody. Glad you could make it. Who do we have here tonight? We've got, uh, looks like four odd people. We've got Mary, of course. We've got Boots and Bounty Homestead. Hi. Haven't seen you guys in a while. Aaron D is with us. Hello, everyone. All right. So you can probably make out a little bit of the, uh, the amaranth right here. I'll pick it up and let you see it. I'll get the bucket out of the way. Of course, I've got a, I've got a great big old kitty pool here. Only this one here in front of me is full of uh, full of some amaranth that we cut down a couple of days ago, and I've had it back up underneath the carport. Hold it up so you can get a look at the stuff that we're working with. We got these plants here, and our objective today is to get these flowers which are already starting to dry really well some of them are not as fully dried as others i've got some here there they're still pretty pretty bright red but oh incidentally that's a good example we want to take this part of the flower for starters and we're going to take it and bring it to this bucket here which is empty i hope <laughs> and we want to strip all of the flower parts like so off of the stem so we just have the stem left behind, and that's it. And then we'll come back and we'll break those up and get the seeds out here in a little bit. But right now we want to get as much of the, the seed and flower. It comes off really easy when it's dry. Out of here. And then we'll separate the, the flower bits, the chaff, from the seeds a little bit later on. So how's everybody doing? Has fall arrived where you guys are at? I can't talk. Has <laughs> fall arrived where you're at? Mary says she'd wear gloves. You know, I'd, I'd have them right here just in case. Sometimes the uh, the dry flower bits can be a bit sharp. And, uh, yeah, that pinched me just a little bit there. Get a little bit of that dried flower biting into your skin. Once you got some calluses on your hands, it's not so bad. But if and you're a faint-hearted city slicker, and you ain't used to getting a little bit of little bit of work done with your hands, I tell you what, this can tear you up a little bit. Yep. <laughs> it's a flower of the same family that you would find uh, lamb's quarters in. You'd find uh, quinoa in the same family of flowers, I believe. Um, we'll find uh, red-rooted pigweed, that, that bane of all cattle farmers, right? Always spraying your, spraying your fields for Canadian pigweed, and, or Canadian thistle and red-rooted pigweed. Well, it's related to those, but it produces a seed that is very, very high in omega-3 fatty acids. Um, 
obviously gluten free because this is not a grain it is a flower seed the seed of a flower so you got lots of protein in there omega-3 fatty acids i don't know what all else uh it was raised primarily in south america for a long 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 time uh, probably before the before the the incas even set up they have gone back before their civilization we don't really know for sure how old it is but uh it makes a very pretty flower and the seeds can be used as a substitute for grain so you can you can grind them up and and cook them like a porridge like you would cook your oatmeal you can grind them up and mix them in with regular flour for baking add a little extra protein Oh, hey. Ooh. there. Still got a little bit of red left in it. Uh, my preferred method of cooking it, if you're going to cook with it or preparing it, is, well, actually, not to cook it at all, but to collect your seeds and then somewhere in the, wow, those cicadas are loud. Somewhere in the middle of winter, whenever you're really, really eager to have something fresh and green on your plate, you just lay those out in a tray and moisten them and let them sprout and then you can have the fresh greens from sprouted amaranth seeds microgreens basically of course you can buy them from somebody who's selling microgreens or you can always get a few amaranth seeds get the plant started in your yard and then once it's established, gather your seeds whenever fall arrives, set them back, and then all throughout the winter, you're just a couple of days away from having something fresh and green simply by taking the seeds and sprouting. Of course, for the past few years, I've just been letting them sort of get nativized. So I've let the plant grow, I've let it go to seed, and I've let it just reseed itself over and over and over again. In the meantime, it's out there during the winter, serving as a source of food for some of our bird species that don't like to migrate in the winter, or whenever they do migrate, this is as far south as they come. That way, the birds will be around, they'll be fed, they'll make lots more little baby birds, They'll catch the bugs in my yard and feed them to their little baby bugs. And I don't have to worry about going out to buy pesticides. I think that's a pretty good deal. And all I have to do is allow a hardy self-seeding annual plant to grow in my yard. And that's it. All I did with these was thin them out. I had a whole bunch get started early on in the spring. And all I did was thin them out to give them about two and a half to three feet a piece in between them so they could develop a fairly decent sized flower head. These are actually fairly small in all actuality. Some years they get huge. All right. Let's see. Let me move this out of the way and go have a look at our comments real quick so, so I can stay on top of what's going on out there. I know you guys didn't tune in just to listen to me talk. Right. Let's see. Vicky Savage is here. Hello, Vicky. Uh, South America, very close. It's a little bit further south than just Mexico. Da -da -da -da. Katie has been planting a fall garden in Zone Six B. Nice. I'm behind in planting my fall garden, so I'm probably only going to go with some really, really short season stuff. Maybe some carrots, some radishes, and eh, maybe some pak choy if I can get away with it. Let's see. <laughs> can you smoke it? No, you can't smoke it. The only thing that would happen if you smoked amaranth is you develop a cough. It's not that kind of a plant. 
Although I did have <laughs> a couple of years ago, I had a uh, had a police officer pull up in front of the yard with a puzzled look, at, a puzzled expression on his face, looking at these these great big old massive plants with these big red buds growing on them all out there in the front yard. He was scratching his head, looking at it. And was, I don't know what that plant is. What in the world is that? Of course, we had to explain to him what it is and what it was for. And then I fed the poor unfortunate fellow some, some fresh daylily blossoms. He ate them, discovered that they were quite tasty and walked away even more perplexed than he was whenever he had first stopped by. <laughs> Because I'm just this random guy that hands him something that tells him to try it and that's not poisonous, they'll like it, and he just did. <laughs> oh, Lordy. The good times, the good times. Yeah, I've, I've, I've never tried smoking amaranth. I probably would not recommend it. Not that kind of a plant. I'll tell you what, though. Mary brought me some, uh, some mullein seeds. Whenever she was home just recently, she picked them up uh, out of the field along the road and most likely made a video about it. And I haven't even watched it yet. I'm such a bad husband. And she brought them in a uh, in a plastic baggie. And it was the, 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 the little bud that the seeds are in from the flower of the, of the mullein plant. And it does look a little bit like that, uh, that other plant that uh, is now legalized and several states in this geographical area that we like to refer to as North America. All right, so we're just working the flowers and the seeds, of course, off of the end of the stem here. Just work it off, work it off, work it off. There you go. Of course, that leaves me with a whole bunch of, of flowers here that we can keep on rub them between our hands to break them up even further. Eventually, we'll blow the lighter dried flower bits off and that'll leave just the seeds behind. In the process of, of doing this, we're gonna have a bunch of seeds in the bottom of the kitty, the kitty pool. The kitty pool is very convenient. It's a nice size, it's big enough that whenever you're scooping up your flowers and throwing them up in the air and letting the wind or somebody with a fan blow the chaff away. You don't have to worry about the seeds going anywhere outside of the area. An uh, old traditional method would have been to use a basket, but uh, I don't happen to have a, a nice little braided reed basket to work with. So I just make do with what I've got. You might try braiding some uh, Braiding some bull rushes or something like that, make a basket, or getting some uh, some nice river cane and splitting it up and doing a little bit of wicker work with river cane one of these days before too awful long. It's a bit on my radar. It's something I want to do, but just haven't got around to it yet. I understand. There's some parts of hill country here you can go and buy those at the at the gas station. You know, there's round to it. There you go. All right. So many of you probably watched that channel, David the Good, and he did this about a month ago. Only he did uh, his seed harvesting from live plants and massaged them to get the seeds out. The seed heads on these are fairly massive and a bit hard to get into the middle of to massage. So my preferred method, that's the trunk. That would be the trunk of the elephant trunk amaranth. My preferred method is to just go ahead and let the plant get dry, and then I can just strip it all off just like that. All right. And this big ball of fluff here in the middle is the reason why it's hard to just massage the seed heads before it's dry. It's just really hard to get anything out of those whenever the flowers are still living. So just wait until the part of the year whenever they're about to go bye-bye, cut them down, let them dry for a day or two. And look at that. And you get all those seeds out of there. Of course, by doing this, I've left a whole bunch more seeds behind on the ground. And that's fine because that's just going to 
get next year's crop started. Here, let me show you one of these that has a little bit more, a little bit more color in it. Here's one that still has some color in it. If you're in arts and crafts, or we're doing something like a uh, little miniature towns or miniature train sets, things like that, you want to make something that looks like little miniature trees. You can prune off a little bit of that, cut it down, and while it's still got color in it, if you want to, or you can always color it later, hit that with a little bit of a, a spray acrylic sealant, and it'll stay just like that forever, looking like a tiny little tree. So there's a arts and craftsy shadow box or a diorama type use for these flowers. And once you got them, so there's that trunk part. And of course, once you got them dried, you can do fun things with them too. Whenever they're fresh, they look great in floral displays. Throw a couple of sprigs in here alongside any other kind of flower you want. It'll look pretty. Uh, these aren't too bad. Either these are not too bad, or I've gotten used to the uh, to the little prickly bits, little sharp parts of the flower as it dries. Who knows? I'm probably just used to it by now. Let me get this bucket down here a little bit. All right. What's going on in the comments here? Vicky was saying, Amaranth. Uh, hey, Recycled Homestead just became a member. That's nice. Hi, welcome. How are you doing? And I just skipped past everything. <laughs> Let me see here. No, this plant will not get you high. Amaranth, okay, here's what Vicky said. Amaranth, chia, and quinoa are all native to the Americas. Quinoa needs to be well rinsed to try to remove the protective saponins. Yeah, it's, it's covered with uh, with a, a little protective layer of a chemical that has a nice soapy feel. As a matter of fact, you could probably use it as a detergent to wash your clothes with it. I don't know from experience, but that's what I'd be guessing. And saponins don't taste good. They're likely to give you indigestion. Possibly even make it throw up. All right. See, whenever the flowers are still are still bright like that, they don't crumble easily, and it's also hard to strip them off the plant. So I'm just going to put that one aside, let it dry a bit more. This is a bit more musty. Oh wow! Look, look, look at that one. Look at that. Isn't that nice? So whenever they're dry, the flowers come off a lot better. This is starting to dry up good. So this is the way the elephant trunk amaranth develops. It's got this really big cluster of seed head here, and then it'll have one strand coming out the top, like the elephant's trunk coming up and out. That's why they call this one elephant trunk amaranth. Okay. I tell you what, this one's still a little bit damp too. It's not quite ready to go. Oh, I can get the I can get the flowers off of it. Not a problem. Say, you guys remember a couple of days ago, what was it last week? It was just last week. Did that little bit on wealth and riches. And there was something I wanted to talk to you about back then that it completely slipped my mind until later. And I said, oh, yeah, I forgot to mention my trip to Thailand where I met a wealthy man. So I'm going to tell you a little story about my trip to a place called Pattaya Beach, Thailand. This occurred when I was in the Navy on board the USS Missouri. We were passing through the neighborhood. And the captain decided he'd like to make a stop in, in Thailand. So he arranged for us to, to stop over at a little place called Pattaya Beach. It's a little tourist town. It has about three streets running along the beach. The beach is nice and pretty. It's all coral underneath, which on the one hand is very pretty. And on the other hand, 
is somewhat hazardous because it's dry coral. And dry coral is sharp and it'll slice your feet to ribbons if you walk on it barefoot. So if you're going to wade in the surf, it's best to wear an old pair of sneakers or something that you don't mind getting cut up. It's better than getting your feet cut. Well, the town does not have a pier. It certainly doesn't have anything like a, a deep water harbor where a, a battleship can pull up and tie off. So we had to take water taxis in from the ship to, to, to the beach, which was quite an experience. And you just sort of hop off of the water taxi and wade the rest of the way into town. Very quaint place. The people are very nice, not entirely because we showed up with a lot of disposable income, but also this, the people are really nice there. A lot of them are, uh, a lot of them are Buddhist. It's kind of interesting to see how uh, a bunch of country Buddhists live. I didn't stay in town the entire time. I, I went out out of town and outside of town, uh, just outside of town, I met a man who was, in his estimation, quite wealthy. He had uh, he had a boar and a sow pig, lots of piglets, enough that. He and his family could have pork for dinner just about any time they wanted it. And he had more chickens than he could count. And that, as far as he was concerned, meant that he was a wealthy man because he had everything he needed and even a little bit more besides. And whenever you're happy and content with your life, that's really all you need. He had no running water. He didn't have a television. And he was happy and content. And consider himself to be wealthy. I thought I might share that image with you for a moment. The chasing after the after the latest toy is something that we do an awful lot up here in the West. We don't take a lot of time to sit down and appreciate the simple things and the and the, the common pleasures that we have all the time. Life does not have to be a rat race. It does not have to be hard. We just overcomplicate things, don't we? There we go. All stripped down. Ready to go. Let me put this to the side for a moment and uh, pay attention to your comments for just a second. Oof. I've got seeds all over all over my table here. Seeds and a little bit of flour. We're going to have a nice crop of amaranth spreading all around the porch next year, I'm pretty sure, because we did this here. Anytime I go and sit down and strip these, I'll have rashes of amaranth pop up wherever I was. It reseeds so readily. All right. Let's see. Mary says, in your salad. Yeah, you, you, you sprout these seeds in the winter, and you've got a basically a fresh sprout, a fresh green that you can have. You can, make, you can use them themselves for the salad, or you can use them as a component in the salad just to give yourself some give yourself something fresh and green to eat during the dark months of the year and speaking of dark it's getting dark out there and i think my little friend has flown on i'm sorry i couldn't show it to you uh i've had a an american goldfinch finally show up you know i was talking about having the three primary colors of birds we got the the blue buntings the red cardinals and i was looking for the american goldfinch and we finally got them they finally showed up i guess they're going to come around in the fall for us but uh, he was out there poking around the bird, bird, bird bath earlier today, so I filled it full, and he's come back and used it a couple times. But I think, I think he's done for the night. All right. Brian has never heard of amaranth. Yeah, I, uh, I I stumbled into amaranth when I was when I was looking at uh, at quinoa because Mary was getting these. Um, Oh, these little, these little uh, cups with the quinoa salad in it. And I was like, that's that's an unusual, that's an unusual uh, food item there. It's not bad, and so I wanted to look in to see about growing it. And I found amaranth in the process and realized it probably grow better here than quinoa. Well, certainly a lot easier to deal with. So we started growing it. There's Arkansas woodcutter. Hello, Mark. 
Sleepless in the Carolinas with us tonight. It's such a colorful plant. It is, and there are many different colors too. This uh, this one is a nice dark red. Oh, there's a. Let me get that. Nice dark red. Look at that. Look at that there. Really nice dark red. But they also come in orange, and there's even one with green flowers. Green. The flowers are green, and the seeds are are light colored. These seeds are are tiny and black, and well, not black. They're more of a a really deep dark purple. Mm. Pretty, pretty plant. It's an annual, but it's an annual that you can treat like a perennial because once you've got it established, unless you do something to kill it, you'll always have it. Let's see. Flips in the Carolinas. Says, Hello, everyone. Hello. How are you doing? Uh, let's see. Wow, I didn't know about that part. Vicky is saying amaranth was so important as a food source that it was part of the native religion and banned by the conquistadors on pain of death. Wow. Didn't let them didn't let them grow it. You would have to grow an awful lot of it for it to be a staple crop, but yes, it could be a staple crop. I just like it as one of the many things that we grow because I like to grow a whole bunch of different things. All right, so Brian is asking what, what what's what's it for? It's actually a food source. That's what it is. This it, it, it's a food plant. The uh, the seeds are, are what we call a pseudo cereal. We got our, our barrel full of power right here. It's a pseudo cereal. The uh, the seeds can be used in, in the same way as you would use grass grains, like a grain, but it's it's not a grain. It's a flower, and as a flower, it has it has some different properties. It's not a monocot. It's a dicot. So people with allergic allergic uh, tendencies or problems reacting to uh, high carbohydrate diets, lots, diets, lots of starch in grass grains, can eat amaranth instead and not have those kinds of reactions. But of course, it doesn't have any gluten in it. It's not good for making bread by itself. You'd have to have something to make your your bread stick together if you were going to be using it completely like a cereal. All right. All right. There was a Recycle Homestead joining up as a new member. We already said hello, hello. I'm just catching up on comments here. Let's see. Arkansas Woodcutter says, I recommend the bull rush method. Yeah, we'll see. Um, I, I've, I've got a spot picked out where I want to go harvest some whenever I've got my, uh, my water feature established. I want to have at least... Okay, Mary's probably going to yell and scream because they're about 500 bucks a piece and I want four of them. But I want to have at least four uh, 1,100 gallon stock tanks. We'll turn them into, into, into frog and fish ponds, a combination of, the two, uh, of them. If possible, we can get, uh, we can get some long ear sunfish to breed. And if they breed, I can, I can start moving them around to the different ponds and their various stages of development so they don't get eaten by the older fish and eventually they'll all wind up either um over there at the adjacent property which is uh the mother-in-law's place yes mary after we remove the sycamore tree we'll put them over there for their their final purge and that would be a spot where you can uh, you can take some light cat light tackle and fish for them so we'll have a little little interactive small pocket pond fishing experience to to enjoy it's either there or the purge spot will be here directly behind where the camera is underneath the pecan tree one of those two spots but uh that's probably a year or two down the line Let's see and we'll have uh we'll have cattails and we'll have american water lotus no, not blue lotus. It won't grow here. Wrong, wrong, wrong zone, people. Wrong zone. But the American water lotus also does have some medicinal properties, which are similar to the uh, the blue Nile lotus, which is not actually a lotus at all. It's actually a water lily. So, you know, 
So it's really an American water lily, and the, the blue lotus of the Nile is not a lotus, it's a lily. So you know, don't get those two confused. It's easy to do, I'm pretty sure. But anyway, both of them have similar uh, medicinal properties, being antispasmodic, uh, sedative, um, apparently uh, a lot of the same properties as valerian and uh, passion flower. So we'll have actually all three of those available for anti-anxiety and spasmodic sedative. I'm sure if people are, are frazzled and have their, 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 their nerves shot from experiencing some traumatic experience, we just might have medicine around here to, to calm them and put them at ease. <laughs> non-narcotic people, non-narcotic. All right. Unfortunately, yeah, I, 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 I can treat you for uh, I can treat you for a variety of ailments. I can even uh, perform some minor surgery and have the the plants necessary to to prevent infection or to help you fight and eliminate infection should you get one. But I don't have any anesthetic, so you're out of luck there. They've made anesthetic illegal to grow, for the most part. I mean, I've heard of the um, wild lettuce thing. I've never tried that. We'll see if it works. All right. So Red is asking, what's that thing? What thing? Which thing? The plant? Let's see. Ah. Oh, Mary's using talk to type. Yeah, amaranth, these guys, whenever they're very, very young, you can use them like salad greens. Whenever they get old, the leaves get tough and leathery and Hard to chew. Mm, a little bit bitter. Actually, tastes like uh, if you've ever had curly dock. Whenever the leaves are, are full and thick, they have that, that sort of green, grassy taste to them. Yeah, not fantastic. Whenever they're, whenever they're, they're whenever the leaves get big. When the leaves are small and tender, you can put them in salad. And shortly after that, you can boil them up like you prepare spinach or greens, turnip greens, mustard greens, collard greens, whatever kind of greens you got. It's a powder. You cook it down, throw in a little bit of fat back in there, and yummy, yummy for the tummy. All right, let me see here. Yep, yep, yep. Southern Boy Prepper came by and said hello. Where are you at? Where are you at? Where are you at? I'm 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 bouncing around here trying to trying to scroll through here. Some of like buckwheat. Yeah, hang on a second. I'll get I'll get back to you on that. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. <laughs> Wow. I scrolled way, way too far down here. All right. There's Southern Boy Prepper saying hello to everyone. Uh, did I say the squirts, <laughs> Mark? <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you most likely have a little bit of intestinal discomfort. You know, when I, I did the thing about making your own, your own charcoal at home, if you ate something that had too much saponin in it, you didn't wash it off, you might experience uh, some... Um, some incontinence uh, of, of the intestines and eating a little bit, or not eating, but uh, you, could, you could wash it down with a little glass of water. Drinking a bit of charcoal might help stop you up. A little basic medicine. Mm. Can you make a beer out of it? Mm. Probably not. I mean, technically, technically you can ferment anything under the right circumstances, but you'd probably be better off if you wanted something that was really, really quick and easy to make a beer out of. Um, get yourself some millet or milo and sprout your your millet or milo uh, grains, and then roast those to make your malt, and then uh, put that in your mash tun with 155 degree water. Let it sit for about two hours and then purge with about 140 degree water. 
wash it through a couple of times and boil that down to get your, your malt sugar out of it. You could sprout Johnson grass seeds and make a beer out of them for, for that matter if you wanted to. I wouldn't say it tastes very good. I think a Milo or Millet beer, if you made one, would taste an awful lot like a wheat beer. Especially if you didn't have any hops to add to it. Eek. But if you were making that up as a as a precursor to making some sort of a, making some sort of a vinegar, or um, or distilling it to make a, a clear grain alcohol, then you probably could do that. All right, let me see here. Oh, Red just said the same thing. Yeah, you can make anything. Yeah, anything from it. So you can make anything into a beer or wine. There's John and Jay Griggs. Hello, hello. Hello, kiddos. Uh, Mark sounds beautiful flower heads. Hey, did you, Mark, did you get some of those amaranth seeds that I sent to you? Did you, did you start them up? Did they grow? Did they, did they? <laughs> Saponos on chemo probably won't make you puke, but you'll probably be running for days, more than likely, yeah. yeah. Brian got blocked from Green Greg's channel. It's what happens when you get too drunk and just type without the cognitive filter. <laughs> People will take it the wrong way. I can't say I haven't ever done anything like that myself, so. All right. <laughs> Jason met Master Poe. <laughs> I am Master Poe. <laughs> what are you talking about? Have you seen me? <laughs> yeah. Rats and races for are for rats and racers. Nah. There's, there's, there's no point to it. I, I, I think Tyler Durden had it right. You know, we're running around working the jobs that we hate to buy stuff that we just don't need. That, that neo-primitive concept. Uh, I don't like the way he went about trying to achieve it, but uh, he's, he, he's, he's kind of got an idea there. <laughs> Let's see. The sleepless in the Carolinas going to try to get some going go in her garden. It'll grow really well in, in, in the Carolinas, north or south. I think it'll grow well all the way down into Florida. Oh, incidentally, they, uh, this particular plant will, will send its roots down into the soil and gather up phosphorus for you. If you've got phosphorus that can be mined from the subsoil and brought to the surface layer, it'll do that for you. So it's a it's a good dynamic accumulator. All of this stuff needs to be chopped up and composted thoroughly to get that out of it before it goes bye-bye. I'll throw these into the uh, into the liquid fertilizer barrels and back after I chop them up. All right. Mary was, I, I'm still way behind here. Mary was saying the seeds are kind of like buckwheat. They are in that Buckwheat is also a pseudo cereal. Did I did I bring that? No, I put it inside. I've, I've got I've got one of those uh, pink soba buckwheats that I, I accidentally cut off while I was weed eating earlier, and uh, I figured I'd, I'd I'd go ahead and divide that up and make some more cuttings and get them started because it turns out they're fairly easy to start from cuttings. You can start them from the seed too, but they're easy enough to start from cuttings. We've got a couple more months where things can grow a bit. And uh, we might be able to get some of that established here around the yard. I think that would be nice. The buckwheat and the alfalfa grown together. I know little rascals, buckwheat and alfalfa were, 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 were childhood friends if, with, from our gang or the little rascals. But it turns out they grow really well together. The, uh, the alfalfa is a nitrogen fixer and the buckwheat's a heavy feeder. So the two of them together... Uh, complement each other. The alfalfa's got purple flowers and the buckwheat's got pink flowers and yeah, they make a nice little nice pretty uh, nice pretty oh, what do I want to say? It's not really a ground cover because they're herbaceous layer annuals except for, oh, wait a minute. No, they're not. They're perennials. Ah. <laughs> they're herbaceous layer perennials. At least the ones I've got at the moment. 
All right, hang on a second. Um, I, you could probably make noodles out of um, out of amaranth, but I don't know of anybody that's tried it. Yeah, amaranth is much more intentionally nutritionally dense and complete than cereal grains. Yep. Yeah, you know, Red says unleavened bread can be made from dock, nettle, or any other seeds. Yeah, if you're if you're not planning on making it rise, then it's not a problem. It'll, it'll, it'll stick together. Brian says it was a hot summer in Minnesota this year. Yeah, we've had unseasonable weather all over the place, haven't we? It's one of the reasons I do like my perennials. They can handle some variances in uh, in climate and keep on ticking. They can handle it a lot better than, than annuals. Some annuals are just so specialized that if you don't have the right conditions, you're not going to be able to grow them. Cranky Frankie says, hey, bro. Hi, Cranky Frankie. How you doing out there? And I'm scrolling way too far. <laughs> All right, let me see. Da -da -da. All you have to do is go to the hospital to get hooked on drugs. Well, unfortunately, doctors are being being trained to uh, to trust what the uh, pharmaceutical company represent them representatives tell them, and uh, that's unfortunate. All right, Vicky's asking, Jason, do you understand? Do I understand correctly? There are varieties of lotus that can grow in zone six. I'm not entirely certain. Um, a lot of people mistake lotus and water lily. It's actually two different two different gen genus of plants. Um, if you're, if you're looking at a, a pond in North America and you see those little white, maybe slightly pinkish flowered plants with the lily pads growing, remember that the lily pad, it's a water lily and a lotus is a different, is a different animal. Some similarities in, in, in general habitat, but entirely different plant. I'm not off, I'm not certain off the top of my head. Water lilies, yes but I don't know about any lotuses that might be able to grow here. All right. Red is starting to have some strange psychic stuff going on. Uh-oh. Okay. Somebody wants me to play some music. All right. All right, let me see here. Web Farmer did a video on making activated charcoal. It's not hard. It's not hard. It's not hard. Um, if you make your charcoal in the way I showed you, in, in, either in a small can or you can make it in, in a larger vessel, but if you can get it to cook off all of its, its flammable vapors without any oxygen touching it at all, to the point where you're left with those those bits of charcoal that make a nice little clink clink whenever you, whenever you tap them, like like they're made out of. Uh, out of china or glass or something like that to make a little pink um that's that that will work just as well you don't even have to, to to treat it with any sort of a weak organic acid from that point let's see the idea of activating charcoal is to get it ready to very quickly bond with oxygen this is what makes it effective for uh, for helping preventing accidental poisoning is it w wants to bond with any oxygen it can any oxygen any free radical any oxidizer any oxygen it bonds to it, and that will allow it to be eliminated from the system without uh, that free oxygen molecule bonding with anything else. All right. Church folks across the street, they had a, a, a Wednesday night get-together, and one of them was playing with the car in the parking lot. All right. Ah, okay. So Ark Ar Sawood Cutter started the amaranth I sent to him, but the competition was too strong. Uh, and I haven't planted the Hopi red dye, so I, I haven't I haven't planted it yet. I've got a. If I'm going to have two different strains, I need to make sure I have enough of a, a geographical difference between them. 
the elephant trunk is all already pretty well established in the front. So if I'm going to grow the, the Hopi red dye out, I'm going to have to do it in the back. So I might get some or try to start some of it in the back along with the uh, with the native corn next year and see how that goes. All right. I could put it along the fence line along with the uh, the alfalfa and buckwheat over there too, for that matter. That way we'll have a, a nitrogen uh, a nitrogen fixer, a phosphorus producer, and then uh, a, a general accumulator in the buckwheat. <laughs> <laughs> Mary said, sounds like a bar was letting out. Yeah. Some days. Some days. All right. Hey, what time is it? Oh, it was quarter after. Wow. I told you we were gonna we were gonna we were gonna open up some mail and look at a few things and and all that. Um I've done a little bit of that 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 work and you don't need to see me doing all that. I've got something special here. This is going to be featuring in an upcoming video. I don't know exactly when, but a uh, neighbor from across the way brought me something special. Let's see what that is. Yeah, it's a rock. It's, it's a rock. It's a rock off of uh, off of his dad's place. Whenever we were out there at the uh, the Turkey Mountain, I've got another one too. Boy, he gave me he gave me two. He gave me two boulders. When we were up there at the the Turkey Mountain Wilderness area while we were walking around, I was looking to see if there was any... Well, oh, hello. <laughs> it's heavy. I was looking to see if there was any of these lying around, but I couldn't find any. All I found up there was some sandstone and maybe a little bit of limestone underneath, and that was the parent rock where we had soil being made in situ up there at the top of the, of the hill. But there weren't any of this particular type of rock available. This is white flint. And if I handle it properly, I'm going to have to do some experimentation because I've only ever seen somebody doing it in person when I was a small boy going up to the, uh, the native village in Tahlequah. I'm going to give a hand at napping some basic flint tools out of that. We'll see if we can start with just the trees and the woods and the rocks of the ground and see if I can, uh, I can start a fire. That'll be fun. All right. Uh, da, 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 da. Vicky is saying all varieties of amaranth will cross promiscuous. Yeah, that's the problem. I'm even worried about letting my uh, my lamb's quarters go to seed. I love lamb's quarters, but uh, if, if it winds up cross pollinating with my amaranth, then we might wind up with a Frankenstein's monster mix of something. And it is an annual, so it's always going to reproduce sexually. So if the uh, the the amaranth and the and the lamb's quarters ever get together, their their offspring is going to to not be like the amaranth that I've been growing. I kind of like the amaranth I've been growing. It has these really really big seed heads, usually about a pound of seeds each, and I would hate for it to be producing seed like the the lamb's quarter does with little tiny faint little seed heads with hardly any seeds at all. In them. I don't want that. I don't want that particular. Um, I don't want that particular set of genetics to get passed on. Green Greg's is in the house. Hello, Jason Neighbors is or Halo. Sorry, Halo. <laughs> Hi, Greg. Lamsaranth. There, there we go. We get Lamsaranth. Ah, you never know. You never know. But it's good to. Uh, it's good to make sure that you've got your uh, your plants mixing genetics periodically. Uh, inbreeding depression is a very serious problem. A lot of people have it with uh, with their corn crops these days, which is why I'm very happy. And I know you can't see it; it's hanging right above your heads there. I'm very happy to have that uh, that big horse spotted corn because as I look through it, I realize it's got all the genetics of just about every strain of corn known to man already in it which means if I wanted to make a, a, a yellow sweet corn, I could breed yellow sweet corn out of it and give you a yellow sweet corn. If I wanted a, a good red flower corn, I could breed the red flower corn out of it and give you a red flower corn. If I wanted a, a fancy little blue corn, 
uh, maybe a blue flint horn of some sort, like uh, certain people have been known to grow. I could I could breed that out of it and give that to you. There's there's all different varieties in there. There's eight row, ten row, twelve row. Uh, I didn't see any, but there could be fourteen and sixteen row as well in there, as well as sweet and flint and dent and even you know something in between characteristics. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, anyway, so. Occasionally, a little genetic mixing is a good thing, but if you want to keep a particular strain like um, like the, the elephant trunk, I, I may as well pull it up and show it to you again. This stuff here, if you want to keep this particular variety of amaranth going, then you'd only want to plant the, the one variety and not plant another variety too close to it, because then you'll wind up with... Uh, something that was in between. You might wind up with something special that was great and you're glad you had it, and you might wind up with something that made you wish you hadn't planted those too close. You never know. Uh, there was a there was a, a species of squash that I tried to get started called, uh, what was that one called? Uh, Lakota. Lakota squash. And it's not exactly the same squash that the, the Lakota people would have been growing. All we know for certain is that some of the some of the genetics for that squash came from people who are living on the west bank of the of the Missouri River. There's a wide variety of different people living on the west bank of the Missouri River, of which the Lakota are one of them. So that particular squash got crossed with something like a Hubbard, and what they're calling Lakota squash now is, in all actuality, uh, a stabilized hybrid. But it is an heirloom. So there we go. But unfortunately, they didn't take. So we're back to the drawing board, looking for the perfect, uh, looking for the perfect squash to grow around here. I'm going to see if I can get a hold of somebody from uh, from the Pawnee or Osage tribe and see if somebody has something uh, something traditional for this region that they they might be willing to share. And I'll share some uh, some of the speckled uh, some of the sacred speckled red corn with them. I do have a little bit of that. Hmm. All right. Ta Mary's liking Greg's news topics. Greg likes to cover the news and give us a little uh, behind the scenes, a little thinking about it. Let's see. <laughs> don't get drunk and don't get drunk and uh, and and and, uh, and live chat is always a, always a, always good advice, Brian. <laughs> Yep. Greg's got all kinds of good information. He's a good guy. Let's see. Brian's waiting to harvest his brassicas. Wow. Let's see. Cabbage, brussel, and swedes. That's kohlrabi. Kohlrabi is a joke. <laughs> it's a funny looking plant, isn't it? Yeah. News and economics and those strange things that, that shape the events in our life. Hey, before I get too too much further down the road, I, I, I promised you I was going to do a little bit of mail opening. I've got a stack over here, so I'm just going to grab mm, whatever's on top. Oh, this one says Mary Hudson on it, so this one might be for Mary. Mary, did, did, you, did you not want me to open this one? Because it's got... It's got several things in it. I think this is some kind of string here. Greg says, I need to interview one a day. Yes, you do. That would be great. I, I would like that. We could have a, could have some fun coming up with uh, concepts for uh, colonizing far-flung planets. It's one of metal exercise I like to engage in. It's like, if we really wanted to do this, what would we need to do? We really wanted to start a colony. We need to have we need to have a lot of people. Speaking of, oh, I didn't even read what this is. This is addressed to me. I didn't order it. Okay, this is something Mary got for me. Ah, 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 ah. Okay, remember when I was doing the expelization and I was talking about needing a needing a good strainer? Well, they. They packaged this really well. I needed a good strainer. 
because you have to make sure that you're washing your hominy thoroughly to get all of your all of your lye off of it, all of your uh, alkaline solution off of it. Because if you get too much alkaline down the old hash and into your stomach, it can throw your uh, can throw your insides for a loop. And let me tell you, I didn't really get my hominy washed as well as I could have. And uh, it did. <laughs> I wound up having to to have some uh, some extra yogurt as such all through the week last week. It was mostly a diet of yogurt in order to to restore my uh, my intestines to proper working order. So here we have oh a stainless steel strainer. Thank you, Mary. That will come in handy the next time I'm working with something like making hominy and nixtamalizing. That's the the processing of corn or other grains. You can also use this on, on other grains. For example, Milo can, can be used on Milo um, to make it more digestible, to get rid of that hard pericarp, the outer covering of the seed, and to break down the protein chains to make it more digestible for you and me. Thank you very much. Of course, Mary's not the only person who can send us stuff. You, anybody can send me stuff. I don't mind. I really don't mind. Okay, this one is also addressed to me. But Mary, if, if, if you don't want me to open up that package, so just say your name on it. I, I won't open it. I'll just, I'll just open up the stuff that's addressed to me. All right. All right, let me see here. Um, Mark is saying, Mark is Arkansas Woodcutter is saying, in space refining and shaping is first priority. Hey, we've, we've got the brain trust here tonight. We've got... Uh, a uh, former physics teacher, Arkansas Woodcutter, is, is Mark. He's a former physics teacher, and we've got a uh, we've got we've got an honest to goodness rocket scientist in the room with Green Greg's there. All right, Greg says, "Don't throw your insides outside." <laughs> Mary says, "I can peek." Okay, I can peek. All right. Now she says she was getting some stuff for me that was that was kitchen related and specifically related to being able to. Uh, to do a better job of, oh, Mary, you shouldn't have. This is, okay, so I guess, I guess this is Christmas, right? Guys, 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 look what she got. Look what she got for me. This was just sort of in my wish list. Boy. Vicky's trying to tell me to get a wider variety of, of fermented foods. I think she's right. I need to, I need to, to, to get some more stuff. So this is... A china cap with a stand, and it's got the it's got the little pestle in there as well. I'm going to go ahead and open up the box so you can see what's actually in it. This is cool. All right. So you've got your corn, you've got your dry corn, your field corn, your your flint corn, or your dent corn. The, the, that kind of nice corn that you can dry and hang up and keep out of out of reach of the critters. And now winter's come, and you're ready to cook it up, and you've got your, your your hardwood ash from your stove that you've gone ahead and sifted to make sure there's no chunks of nasty stuff in there. Put that down into the bucket, covered it with some hot water, and let it steep. And after all the ash is settled, you pour off that, that liquid that has the calcium carbonate leached into it. You pour that into the bucket. You pour it over your, over your dry corn, and you let it sit there for at least a day or two, however long it takes. You can let it take a couple of days. Just come back and check on it periodically. After those corn kernels begin to plump up, they swell up, and the skin splits. You can take that and you can wash it off thoroughly. And it's nice and soft at this point, right? That's whenever that's whenever a contraption like this comes in handy. You've got the stand right here. You're gonna put a, a bowl underneath it to underneath put a bowl to catch your your mashed up hominy, your corn. And then you take this contraption here, which is like a colander, stainless steel with lots of tiny little holes and point. We call this a china cap. It's used for making tomato paste as well. And you put that sorry, down in there. I should have the camera up a little bit higher. Put, the cap down, put that cap down in there like so. And now you've got this device here that you just use to mash that soft grain 
or tomatoes or whatever else is that you're that you're pulping just like so that caps it catches in your bowl now you can take that and mix it up with a little bit of lard or bacon fat if you like mash it up fry it up and you've got homemade corn cake or homemade corn tortillas without needing a grinding meal a grinding mill sorry without needing a grinding mill. So there you go. Do that china cap. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So in between being able to to get our our, uh, our nixtamalization done properly without accidentally poisoning ourselves and processing it to, to actually make tortillas. That's awesome. All right. Let me see. Mary says she loves kimchi. She does. Uh, Mark Sowisco just said, build, just building space mega platforms for oil refinement or other space harvested material. Now, I think a lot of the, a lot of the major work that we're, we're going to be doing in that area is going to come about with communities that are established off planet. I think getting to the moon and establishing a, a functional base on the moon where people live and work full time is going to be a good idea because can you imagine this so this old farts and i'm not that old there there are people who are considerably <laughs> older who are in need of uh in need of, of gainful employment but have uh have wonderful skills are sitting around feeling useless right now because they aren't young and spry anymore, but you can imagine them going to work at one sixth of Earth's gravity. All of a sudden, they can get around anymore and being or getting getting around again and being old is no longer that big of a, a problem for them. Working at one sixth of Earth's gravity for somebody with tired old bones might be might be kind of nice. All right, so there's another kind of stainless steel strainer. All right. What else? What else did she send me? I've got all kinds of things. Let's see what's going on here. Let's see. Greg says a six would be good for your bum knee. Yeah, it would. Yep, yep. Yeah, I got a problem with my left shoulder. It makes it hard to pick up heavy objects and move them around. So imagine being able to pick up 50 pounds and multiply that by six. That's 300 pounds. Pick up and move 300 pounds at once. It'd be demigods. <laughs> All right. Greg's saying email me at greengregs, greg at greengregs.com. All right. Oh, we'll set up a time that, that we can do a we can, we can do a little interview. Let's see, Brian's got a busted camera. Ah, oh, tell you what, there's a bunch of cheap cameras out there, but the really good ones are still expensive. Oh yeah, that one there is not a very expensive one. This is another one that's it's kind of heavy and it's made out to. So Jason, let's see what's in here. Let's see what's in here. We've got, well, wouldn't you know it? This is exactly what we needed. We've got, we got this, uh, this packing material. We, we need, we need lots of packing material. Oh, this is, this is just general household stuff. We got some uh, carpet powder for fleas. All right. Apparently, uh, Mary's dog's got some, some flea issues and might have brought them home. What's this? Oh, oh this is uh, flypaper strips. So those adhesive strips, you lay them down and bugs get stuck on them. And, oh, poison. Harris Home Pest Control. Uh, I'll bet but half the bugs are already immune to this by now. 
All right. There's. Let's see what else we have here. We got another little box over. I'm not going to mess with that one. Though. Nope, that one's dressed to me too. All right. Let's see. Oh, hey, what's going on here? Ta -da. Gypsy and Vanilla Griller here. Mark's head is in space. Yeah, yeah. John from uh, John Conrad Farms is here. That's that's cousin John. <laughs> okay, Brian. <laughs> Brian says I have to trap mice if I don't eat the cheese myself. <laughs> funny, funny. All right. So, guys, who come late this evening? I get started on uh, separating this this amaranth and this big tub here beside me. This one right there. Separating that from the plant. We've got the, the flower petals right here. They still need to dry down a little bit more before we can separate the seeds from them. But if I dig around here in the in the bottom, I can grab a pinch of them. There's some in the bottom already. Uh, so that's what we started out with. Um, I've got a full video coming out. Later on this week, we'll have a little bit of that processing, and I've got some, uh, I've got some old seed heads from from last year that I can finish processing all together for that video. I should have that out come Friday. All right, let me see here. Greg's got to run, got to do a few things before he goes live. Maybe even as early as nine. Greg often goes live on Wednesday nights as well, usually just a little bit later. And if you're looking for it, it's often called something silly like Wotans or Wotans. Woken World Wednesday, but if you just have your your uh, your your little bell icon for Green Greg's selected to all, you'll be able to get the notification whenever he's going live. But usually Wednesday night he's going, um, and it's it's usually quite a hoot. Uh, Gypsy and Vanilla Grill is asking, "What is amaranth used for?" Uh, amaranth is a pseudo cereal, much like buckwheat. It's a flower, not a not a, a grass grain but it can be substituted for grains in a number of different recipes. It is gluten-free, it is very nutritious, far more nutritious than most of your other uh, cereal grains that are out there. And uh, it's a native to the Americas. It was grown in South America for thousands upon thousands of years before the Europeans ever arrived here. And it's still grown to this very day. It's a wonderful plant. Whenever it's, whenever it's alive, it's, it's a, a very pretty, I don't know if you can make it out too well with the with the light fading the way it is, let me get this over here so some of that light from the side up there can get to it. Nice, lovely, or lovely flowers on this, and whenever whenever they dry out, they produce little oh about millimeter sized each seeds, about a pound of them per plant, and those are excellent for sprouting for microgreens. If you want to have something nice and fresh and green on your plate in the middle of winter, I recommend getting some kind of amaranth and getting it started in your yard and then you can just collect your, your seed heads in the fall and have the seeds for sprouting for your greens all throughout the winter as a, a supplement to your diet. Add a little bit of vitamins and minerals to your diet. All right. So did I cover everything? Is that it? What it's used for? Yeah. Uh, you can also pop it like a popcorn and uh, make little, little amaranth crisps that way. You can grind it up and use it for uh, for anything that you would use any grain for. But if you are going to bake with it, since it has no gluten, you would need to add some kind of a glutinous flour, either wheat or rice or something else that has gluten in it, like oats, may and barley might, so that you can make your, your, your bread dough stick together. All right. Mary says salad greens. That's, that's the best use of it, as far as I know using it for salad greens. Um, that's cool. Rice is making bread out of wheat bean. But, uh, uh, spelt, perhaps? Feeding, feeding growing fodder for the chickens. Yeah, there's a lot, a, lot of, a lot of interesting. Let's see, Gypsy and Vanilla Gorilla says it's ginseng season. That's neat. You learn how to make a flower out of sunflower stalks? That's nice. I mean, did you, you've got a video of that, right? I, I think I probably want to go see it, actually. <laughs> All right. Greg is signing off. Bye, Greg. All righty. Oy. 
So, anyways, what were we doing? Oh, yeah, we're going to open some mail here. So, I already showed you what Mary got me, the, the, the china cap with the, with the pestle so we can mash our, uh, mash our hominy to make pizzoli. Pizzoli. How do you pronounce that? Hey, if Joe Serrano is with us tonight, he could probably tell us what the right pronunciation was. By golly. Let me see. Mary ordered something else up over here, but I've got to wander over here to pick it up. I'll bet it's heavy, too. Oh, it's not that bad. Oh, it's not that bad. All right, what's in this thing? So ship to Jason Avers. It's from Gut. Gut. Gutwall's Books in Byron, Georgia. Books? Maybe I got books. All right. A hey, hard copy is king. If, if something happened that caused the information age to come to a screeching halt, people that have physical books have information at their fingertips still. And everyone else is scratching their heads, wondering what to do because they can't just Google it anymore. Okay, let's see here. What do we have? Oh, Mary. All right. She got a book set. How nice. What's up here? Okay, so Mary got this for me. Uh, it is. It says The Art of War on the back, and it has... A series of books in it. Uh, let's see. Starts out, it's got a journal. Questions and replies. Three strategies to uh, of Hong Shigong. Methods of the Sima. I don't know that. Taigong, Six Great Teachings. Weilin Si, Wu Si, and the Art of War. Interesting. So, there we go. Oh, Art of War book set. Fun, fun, fun. There was a uh, there was a book that we have, and I've managed to misplace it. And it's uh, it's a paperback that has that has uh, two books bound in the same in the same book. One of them is called Fire in the Sky, and unless you have a uh, a, a deep background in Eastern philosophy, reading the book will do you no good because it's like reading. Um, the coded portion of a coded message. If you if you don't know the rest of it, it won't make any sense. The other portion of the book, though, is a, a Taoist classic called uh, "The Keeper of the of the Secret Storehouse," in which you will find a number of very interesting uh, bits of wisdom, particularly with regards to uh, administering a nation. If you were ever put in the position where you would have to do something like that. It's unfortunate that none of our world leaders have ever bothered to read it. <laughs> because, wow, do they do things the wrong way constantly. Almost intentionally, it seems. All right, let me see. There's so many different ways that you can do it right. And they consistently find the, the way to do it wrong all the time. All right. Tibetan Book of the Dead. Mark is asking. Um, no, but I, you know, I do have, I do have quite a few, uh, quite a few uh, Tibetan Buddhist works. Most of them are you know, Dalai Lama stuff. Not bad, not bad. Uh, let me see. Okay, right, Gypsy and Vanilla Grill saying, that although they don't have a video, there are some good ones out there. Of. Um, Making flour out of sunflower stalks. That's something I'm going to have to investigate. Because I do have sunflower stalks. It's too late, really, for, I, for us to make flour out of them. I've already, I've already cut them down and chopped them up. But now that I know that it's possible, and I know that I'll be growing more sunflowers in the future, um, yeah, I'll, I'll investigate that. That, that, would be, that would be very cool. Vicky says, Amaranth popped in a dry pan. Yeah, it has to be dry. Not, not oiled like popcorn. Uh, Arkansas Woodcutter saying, is Greg going live? Yeah, probably as early as maybe 9 o'clock, so here pretty soon. Uh, stone, 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 stone. Brian says, he's got uh, he's got that tool, China Cap. Use it on his grapes. Yeah, you were talking uh, 
it was in 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 the comments a while back about up where you are in Minnesota, about the only only fruit you can grow are the Concord grapes. <laughs> and I told you, my brothers and I used to go and, and pick the the unripe ones from the the vine growing next to the to, to the gazebo of my grandmother's garden, and we pick the unripe ones and use them for for slingshot ammo. They hurt, but they they won't do any real damage. I mean, you put an eye out, I guess, but but uh, way too many seeds to, to make them make them too much fun to eat. They're sweet. They're good. It's just too many seeds for 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 us spoiled kids. Let's see. Misplaced book, you can hope to find what's lost in a house fire is irretrievable. Oh no, you all, you almost you almost you almost sound like a a, a Taoist <laughs> writer, Vicky. <laughs> All right. Mark says, I know some Chinese. Why would you not learn the language of one billion people? There you go. It might help to know a little bit. At least enough to be able to to uh, to, to be polite to people and, and, and then ask them politely if, if they can can speak English because your your Chinese is inadequate and then they can they can show off their particular skills and and feel good about themselves giving it a person the gift of self-esteem is always a nice gift to give especially when it costs you nothing all right yep 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 just about everyone around the world speaks english these days but you never know that could change Slingshot with clothes hangers, stick of wood, the good old days. <laughs> yeah, we used to get the, uh, the little wrist rockets with little power bands on the back of them. Fun times, fun times. In any case, hey, it is 847. Greg says he's going to go live maybe as early as 9, so I'm going to go ahead and, and get off here and try to put everything away. As you can tell, I've got... Uh, I got my work cut out for me, but we're gonna let this uh, we're gonna let this amaranth dry a couple more days before we try to get the seeds out of it, and then hopefully I'll have uh, some video here for your Friday of some of the older plants that I've got separating the uh, separating the seed from the chaff. That'll be fun, and you can look for that coming up on Friday. Paper slingshots. Yeah. Oh wow. Vicky says we lost generations of books when my parents' retirement home burned down. Oh, 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 oh. There was one more package that we had not opened. Mary says she might be doing some uh, some gear videos here pretty soon. And that might be what's in here. Or it might be something sensitive and personal that you don't want anybody to see. You never know. What in the world could she have in here? Let's see. All right. I thought there was string in here. What is this? 50 foot of paracord. There you go. Sensible brown paracord. Not neon pink. All right. Now, this is something called an emergency bivy. Mary will have to tell you about what that is and what it's for. So if you are seeing Mary as Tulsa Fox, you can find her channel. And uh, she can tell you what this stuff is whenever she goes and plays with it. This is a beach blanket, sandproof. I wish I had one of those when I was younger. It's for traveling and camping. There we go. There's a beach blanket, a sandproof beach blanket. So you what? When they say sand gets into everything, they aren't kidding. What do we have here? She has instant cold compress. Oh, 
All right, so here's something to throw into your into your first aid kit, I suppose. It's it's got a, a binary component in here, uh, a couple of chemicals, and a liquid component inside of a inside of a vial. You break the vial, it would be a glass vial. You break it open, mix the chemicals together, and they have an endothermic reaction. Endothermic meaning they absorb heat as the the chemicals combine to form new compounds. Specifically, what chemicals? I don't know off the top of my head. Calcium, ammonium, nitrate, and water. So there you go. So you've got <laughs> ammonium, nitrate, calcium, and then water as the uh, as the activator. Because in dry form they won't they won't react. They have to have the water as a medium. So you break the vial with water inside of it, and or it might be one where you add the water at the top and then seal the bag. I don't know how to take them out and look at them. Anyway, fun stuff, fun stuff. Now that's all the mail I've got for the moment. Nobody sent me. Nobody sent me a, a, a box full of hundred dollar bills. Darn it. Who? All right. <laughs> it's like can warmer, she says, but they're cold. All right. There we go. All right. Well, I guess it's right about time for us to go uh, to go uh, go check out uh, Greg Allison and Green Greg's. But I suppose before before we go, we'll do a little do a little music. All right. So this is a C chord, and this is a G chord. So we have this established, right? Now, if you've got a C chord. And you decide that you want to start picking some strings on the C chord. You can pick two strings together. For here, for here an example, I'm going to take my, my, my middle finger and my thumb, and I'm going to pinch these two strings together. Right? So I'm playing a C chord, and I pinch those two strings together to make a particular sound. And I can just pick a couple notes in between, so I can do this. That's called an arpeggio. Now you can vary it up. And you can you can do your arpeggio in two parts. For example, I can I can pick here, and then I can pick these two and make a slightly different note, right? And then I can always add a little to my C note and make it a C add nine, right? So we can do this arpeggio with with, with, with the C chord. Hey, that's a G. All right, and this is also a G chord with my finger here, in addition to being here. But I'm not going to pick the high note. I'm just going to hit here, and once again, pinching between the thumb and the forefinger, we're doing arpeggios on a G chord. And I'm not violating any copyright because I'm just playing arpeggios on a C and a G chord. That's all I'm doing. So there's <laughs> there's a tune you might recognize. But it's really a very, very simple, just a couple of arpeggios on two very, very, very common chords on the guitar. So, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, let's see here. John says he could use a fistful of money right now. Uh, Mark, Mark, swapping tracks. Mark, swapping tracks. And Marcus is trying to survive the year. Oh, Lord. Mark has been hauling uh, has been hauling camper trailers back and forth 
for a living for a bit, which has got to be it's got to be an interesting job. All right, I don't know how well this is going to work. Um, without the capo, this would be this would be an A minor chord, and then this is a A sus seven. But it's not because we're going to move it up a half step. That's something I'm kind of working on, but I, I don't know what else I'm going to do with it. Probably I'm going to go to an F up here, or maybe a an F minor. I don't know. We'll figure it out one of these days. Oh, yeah. In any case, hey, guys, I'd like to thank you all for joining me here tonight. I know there's other places you could be. I do appreciate you coming out. Uh, let me see here. Ta -ta. Hmm. Vicky's giving us an update on her property. She says she may wind up selling a few select trees for high value timber. So we'll be walking, walking the land to look. You know, you can always, um, if you've got a lot of acreage and there's a lot of decent timber on it, you can always uh, help finance the uh, or pay off the loan if, you're, if you've got a loan on on the property by selling timber. Just got to be careful with some of these outfits that uh, they they are indeed going to cut just the things that you told them to cut and not cut things that they're not supposed to cut, including in some cases it's known to happen other people's property. So they have to know exactly what the property boundaries are and things like that. But I mean, you, you can you can in some cases almost entirely pay off your note with uh, with timber sales that's that's a pretty good thing to do if you've got the uh, if you've got the land for it and you've got the trees for it brian says he played mary had a little lamb oh probably yeah um <laughs> yeah brian if, if, if i'm playing if i'm playing a tune that it, that is easily recognizable there's always a chance that uh, that I will have to either remove it or uh, share any monetization with the copyright holder. And it really just depends on, on the music. If it's public domain, then there's no problem. Um, if it's music that's owned by a rep record company, typically they're the ones that are going to insist on getting their, their, their pay. If it's owned by the original artist, in a lot of cases, as long as you credit the original artist, they're more than happy to, to let you do a cover of their music and go, oh, yay, I, I like what you did with it or or what have you. Um, most musicians are, are, are not uptight about how their, their music is used, as long as some people are playing it, listening it, listening to it and enjoying it and knowing who it was that was responsible for bringing it to them. They're happy. <laughs> All right, Mary or, or Vicky. Sorry, I'm getting everybody mixed up here today. Vicky says she's owned her property free and clear for 27 years. So this would just be this would be just cash in the piggy bank if you sell off some timber. That's awesome. And the person who's going to be doing the walk has a well-established reputation. That's good. That's really good. If I was doing it, not that I tell anybody how to do it, but if I, if I was doing it, starting out with with, with an acreage that I had. I'd begin with uh, I'd begin with the timber sales and then follow up with the forestry mulcher <laughs> and go through and 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 turn all the the trees that I didn't want into into mulch 
and then come through and plant the stuff that I wanted and then have, have the full reset. But you probably wouldn't, I don't know. Doing that with 100 acres all at once would be a bit expensive and a lot of work. Smaller amounts, you know, 5, 10 acres probably pull off a little bit easier. Yeah. Kids are out on the bike trail with their little headlamps and the generators on their bicycles. It's getting dark out there. It's a good thing I put that light up. <laughs> Brian says, figure out what you can and cannot play. It's pleasurable to me. I'm a one dollar customer. <laughs> yeah, I could I could play pants. <laughs> I I've got I've got one special song coming up. Um I got one special com song coming up that I probably will get a a, a copyright claim for come November. Be performing that uh, as a tribute uh, in November. But uh, while well, I had the capo up there, I like to I like to, to come up with little instrumentals that probably you know, could have lyrics to them at some point. That's another one that I'm working on. We'll see how that turns out. Um, sometimes, sometimes I, I get lyrics to go along with them. Sometimes, but uh, I don't know. It's weird. The, sometimes the, the the poetry comes to me at one at one end, and the music comes to me from somewhere else. And the poetry that I that I wind up getting the muse for doesn't fit the music that I I, I stumble into. So, you know, sometimes you need the band for collaborative effort to make the songs work to come up with original stuff. So yeah, uh, Mary's correct. That would be Edmund Fitzgerald, and I will be performing that come come November, uh, in in honor of the people that that got sunk with the Edmund Fitzgerald. Not to mention them, but all the other uh, folks that have been lost on the Great Lakes through the years uh, on those ore boats. Very very hazardous profession, hauling ore across the Great Lakes. In case you didn't know, there are a lot of shipwrecks down there. A lot of them. All right. Guys, it is 9 o'clock. I know uh, Greg said he was going to be trying to come on a little bit later on, right around 9 or so. So I'm going to go ahead and head off. Guys, thank you for joining me tonight. You have a wonderful evening. If you found this video informative or entertaining, well, you know what to do. I will catch you next time.